السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So today we're going to spend a few hours talking about fasting. Inshallah ta'ala, give you a chance to ask some questions. Uh, the book I'm going to be going through, more or less, uh, is Nur al Ibah, which is a text that's basically uh, an intermediate text on uh, fiqh, Hanafi jurisprudence. Okay. Now, the commentator, he gives some um, uh, clues as to the Shafi'i school as well, so we'll deal with that a little bit, but primarily we're going to look at the Hanafi school. So this is usually the text that's studied after the first text, according to a traditional curriculum. The first text is called The Ascent of Felicity, uh, which is Maraq uh, al-Sa'adat, Maraq al-Sa'adat, The Ascent of Felicity. And I highly recommend this book. It's translated, it's a beautiful translation by uh, Sheikh Faraz Khan. It's, you can find it on Amazon. And that's really the primer or the introductory, the novice book of Hanafi fiqh. Uh, and then you probably study this book or the Mukhtasar of Imam al Quduri, and then you get to books like Al Hidayah and Radul Muhtar and things like that, Ibn Abidin, advanced texts of Hanafi fiqh. So I chose this book because uh, it's quite thorough. Right? Uh, and many of the questions that you might be thinking about during the course of the seminar are probably going to be answered by the text, inshallah ta'ala. But you can ask your questions. Feel free to ask. A question at any time. Just raise your hand, get my attention somehow, and we'll try to answer your question, inshallah ta'ala. This class is also sort of geared towards adults uh, because this is fiqh and there's some things that are of an adult nature. Uh, so, viewer discretion is advised if there's children here. Um, really should be 15 or over. If they're young, I mean, I'm going to use euphemistic language, so I don't think they're going to understand. But there are things we have to talk about as far as fiqh wise people have questions about or people are too embarrassed to ask about so we're going to have to cover those those types of things inshallah ta'ala any questions before we begin name of the book Nurul Iba. let me write it on the board for you He's also the, the author of the, the uh, Center of Felicity, Malafa Sa'adat. He's a great scholar, Azhari scholar from Egypt. Nurul Iba, the light of clarification. Iba or Iba? Iba. And then a B? Ha. Sorry, these pens are not very good. Yeah. The color red is very hard to it's see. It's very red. Yeah. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're black oh, markers. Yeah. the chapter on fasting, a.k.a. Siyam. So he begins by giving the linguistic definition of Saul, right? Because there's a definition, Logatan, linguistic, and then Shara'an, a legal definition. 
So the linguistic definition of tsom or siyam is abstention, abstention, or abstinence, whether it's from speaking or acting or eating or drinking or other things. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 183. O oh, you who believe, fasting is prescribed upon you. Kutiba means that it's fard, that it's obligatory. Right? Just as it was prescribed on those before you. Right? In order that you might have taqwa. So the aim of fasting is to have consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not thinking about food and drink and things like that. We're not being distracted. Uh, we can focus on our spirit and, and uh, increase our relationship and our presence of mind with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Focus on the heart, inshallah ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, كَمْ مِنْ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ سِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الدَّمَعَ How many people fast? And they get nothing from their fast except for hunger and thirst. Right? So missing the point of the fast. So um, there are several fast days uh, amongst the Jews. Um, he mentions here Eidu Som al Ghufran, Eidu Som al Ghufran, which is the the fast, the, the festival of the fast of forgiveness or Yom Kippur. It's a 25-hour fast. There's several fast days in Judaism. The Christians also Som al Arba'in, Som al Arba'in, which is a 40-day fast which is called Lent, which begins on Ash Wednesday and ends on Good Friday. And this is supposed to commemorate Isa alayhi salam fasting in the wilderness for 40 days before the Injil was revealed to him. In the Quran in Surah Maryam, uh, Maryam is uh, quoted as saying, إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ سَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيًّا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her that if you should see any human being say that I have vowed a fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what's interesting about that is she had just eaten some dates and now she's saying I'm fasting. So what kind of fast is that? So the previous ummah, the previous uh, nations, they had different types of fasts. Okay. So the ulama say here that the fast that Maryam alayhi salam is doing is a fast from ordinary household meals. Ordinary household meals. And also, they used to take vows of silence. So if someone speaks to you, you can only tell them, in these signs, I'm fasting, and you can't speak after that. Right? So this has been abrogated in our religion. We don't take vows of silence. Okay. <clears throat> so then he has the, uh, the shara'an, the legal definition of fasting. He says, Fasting is to abstain during the day from allowing anything to enter into the stomach through the mouth, the nose, or cavity in the body, whether intentionally or by mistake, or that which has the same legal status of the stomach, such as the brain. For example, if a person suffers an injury and places medicine on it, the fast is void if the medicine penetrates the cavity and enters the body. We'll talk more about this. Inshallah. In addition, fasting is to abstain from sexual gratification along with the intention of fasting. So it is obligatory for us to have the intention of fasting. We have to form an intention. How do we do that? It's done in the heart. The intention does not have to be on the tongue. If you take a nadr, if you take a vow, then it has to be on the tongue and on the heart. If you take a vow, we'll talk about vows, right? But the intention for fasting is a firm resolve in the heart, regardless of the type of fast, because there's different types of fasts. There's a fard, there's wajib, there's sunnah, there's mustahab, there's makru, right? We'll talk all about, we'll talk about these, these legal distinctions, okay? But whatever type of fast you have, you have to have an intention. 
Now, when do you make this intention? And do you have to have specificity? Do you have to have ta'yeen? Do you have to be specific in your intention? We'll talk about that, inshallah ta'ala, as well. The reason which obligates Ramadan, sababu wujub is sawm, the cause which obligates the fasting of Ramadan is one's presence in the month of Ramadan, and every day that comes, uh, it's obligatory for that person to continue performing the fast. So we know that much, right? For in Ramadan, we fast, and this is fault. <clears throat> now the ruling and the conditions that render it obligatory. So he says, it is fault, compulsory, mandatory, to perform the current Ramadan, as well as missed fasts from a previous year. These are called qadha. Right, so the Hanafi school, you have to make up missed fasts. Okay, it is fard, is obligatory to do that. And fasting is obligatory on anyone who meets four conditions: al Islam, wal aqlu, wal bulughu, wal ilm. So, if you're a Muslim, if you have uh, aql, right? If you're sane, you're not insane. So, what's the definition of an insane person? An insane person is someone who cannot grasp the difference, for example, between a fard and a wajib. If you explain it to him, he just doesn't get it. He, he can't get it intellectually, no matter how much you explain it to that person. He can't understand subtleties like that. Okay? And then maturity, balik, they're an adult. Right? So they're Muslim, they have sound mind, and they're an adult, they're not a child and they have knowledge of the fast. And then he goes on here to talk about Darul Harb and Darul Salam or Darul Islam. And these are really sort of derivative terms from the later Mujtahideen. So like the pre-modern world, right? Basically the world was a bunch of empires, you know, faith empires that were constantly expanding or retracting. So a person's uh, political affiliation was always conflated with their religious designation. That's why apostasy in traditional texts was a capital offense. Because when one apostates changes their religion, right, there is political ramifications to that in the pre-modern world. Nowadays, it's not black and white like that with the rise of secularism and the nation state, right? So it's not Dawr al-Har, Dawr al-Islam. I mean, these words are not mentioned in the Quran or in Hadith. Again, this is the ijtihad of later scholars. Right? So people like in America, they convert out of Christianity and become Muslim all the time. It doesn't mean that they're turning their backs against their citizenship of being American. Right? So it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced issue. But he says here, uh, for the sake of uh, quoting the text here, he says that if someone converts to Islam in Darul Harb, right, in an empire that is actively fighting against the Muslim caliphate, right, and there are no Muslims in that land, then he doesn't have to fast. However, if he meets two Muslims that are upright and tell him about the fast, then he has to fast. And the two companions of Abu Hanifa, they said, even if they're not upright, then he has to fast. So who are these two companions? So we should write these names on the board because they're important in the Hanafi school. So obviously the Hanafi school is named after Abu Hanifa, right? So I'm going to erase this here. Abu Hanifa's real name is Nu'man. Nu'man ibn Thabit, and he died 150 Hijri. Nu'man ibn Thabit. So the B here, with a period, means Ibn, the son of Thabit. The main codifiers of the Hanafi school, however, are his two students, and the, and the book calls them the two companions, or the two scholars, as Shaykh Khan. And their names are Muhammad as Shaytani. Muhammad as Shaytani. Does anyone know the name of the other one? No? Qadi Abu Yusuf ibn Ibrahim. Qadi Abu Yusuf ah, ibn Ibrahim. See this, let me know. Abu Hanifa was quite a genius. Um, he was 
not only a first-rate jurist, but he was also a great what's acclaimed a great theologian. And he used to engage in debates with atheists in different heretical groups. Um, there's a story about him. It may be an apocryphal story, but the Hanafis like it. At one time he was teaching a class outdoors, and an atheist approached him and said, I have, I have questions for you, Sheikh. He said, yes. Fobo asked the questions. And he said, <clears throat> he said, uh, why do you believe in God when you can't see him? Number one. Uh, then he said, why is, why is, how can shaitan be punished with fire when he's made of fire? And number three, he said, uh, um, why does Allah take me to account for things he knows I'm going to do? You hear the story. <laughs> so then Abu Hanifa, he thought about it, and then he sort of you know, looked up and looked down, and then he picked up some clay, and he started making a ball out of it. And then he threw it at the man and hit it between the eyes. And then the man was offended. He goes to the Qadi and pressed charges against Abu Hanifa. So then a deputy from the court comes to Abu Hanifa and he says, you have to come to court. He's charging you with assault and battery. You have to stand trial. Abu Hanifa goes and the judge is very surprised. This is Shaykh al-Islam. Why did you do this? And Abu Hanifa said, I answered his questions. So how did you do that? He said, well, he said, how will shaitan punish with fire when he's made from fire? He's made from clay. I punished him with clay. <laughs> Why do you believe in God when you can't see him? Well, you can't see pain, but I made him feel pain. So pain is real. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Right? And then as to his third question, why does Allah take you to account for things when he knows you're going to do it? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew I was going to throw the clay at his head. So why am I in court right now? Just let me go. Allah knew I was going to do it. And there's other stories. Yeah, there's yeah. Many other. Many other. One time a Khawarij came to him and wanted to kill him. A man from the Khawarij. They hated Imam Ali. They made takfir of Ali because he, had the, he did the uh, tahkim, arbitration with Muawiyah. And he said, no, there's no arbitration. So this man came with a sword and was coming towards Abu Hanifa. And his students stopped him. <laughs> and then Abu Hanifa, he got up and he, he calmed him down. He said, relax, let's talk about this. And the man said, okay, let's talk about this. Let's have an agreement that you bring someone and I bring someone. Let's sit down and talk about it. And the man from the Hawaii said, okay, that sounds good. And Abu Hanifa said, that's tahkim. You just made arbitration. So we sh should we kill you too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This other time. And Abu Hanifa was very uh, modest as well. This man came to him in the masjid one time and started calling him all these names, and Zindiq and heretic and all these types of things. Abu Hanifa just started crying. And he said to the man, he said, I'm just a man trying to get to Jannah. You know, I'm just trying to get to Jannah. And the man was taken aback and then they, they hugged it out. <laughs> anyway, the Shaykhain, Muhammad al-Shaybani, Qadi Abu Yusuf, Ibn Ibrahim, these are the, the main codifiers of the Hanafi school. And then there's hundreds of scholars that followed them to the present day. Because here's the thing about a madhab. It's not a school of law that was sealed 1,200 years ago, and that's it, follow it or nothing. These schools are constantly changing, right? Because that's the nature of Sharia. It has to constantly change because our circumstances change. There are things in the Sharia that never change. They're called thawabit, thawabit, right? These are translated as immutables. They never change. Prayer, fasting, charity, there's things that you always have to do. They transcend zaman and makan, right? And even there, there's, you know, for example, um, if your life is being threatened uh, in the street, you can take your hijab off. If you're thirsty, you're dying of thirst, you can drink wine. I mean, those are sort of uh, really sort of um, exceptional cases. but. Basically, there are thawabit. And then there are things that are called variables. Mutaghayyarat. Mutaghayyarat. So, for example, if you look in the books of Hanafi Fit, in the pre-modern books, and you, and you try to look for, you know, praying on an airplane, you're, you're not going to find it anywhere, right? Because <laughs> there's no airplanes back then. So, in other words, this requires ijtihad. We need scholars, modern-day scholars, post-modern scholars, to deal with these issues. And there's, there's an opinion about playing on an airplane, praying on an airplane. Because one of the conditions of praying, according to hadith, is that you have to be stabilized on the earth, right? So you can pray on the top floor of a building because it's, it's rooted into the earth, right? Uh, and they say you can pray on a boat 
because you're connected to water and the water is connected to the earth. But then what about if you're in a plane? So some of the Urnama said, you're not connected to the earth, you don't have to pray on an airplane. Other Urnama said, but wind has mass. I can sell you some wind. I can take some air and sell it to you. It's something. It blows the trees. That means there's something there. Therefore, you are connected to the earth. Even though you're moving, you still have to pray. And there, you know, there's a difference of opinion. That's just one example of how modern-day scholars deal with pre-modern texts. It's not, here's, here's the Hanafi school, take it or leave it, and khalas. No, it's, it's always changing and revising, and that's the nature of the Sharia. So, Abdullah bin Bayad, he talks about Darul Muwatana. You know, we talk about Darul Harf, Darul Islam. He talks about the Dar of good citizenship. Right? So you have to be a good citizen, no matter what your religion is. Whether you're Muslim, <coughs> convert out of Islam, convert out of Christianity. If you live in a secular country like America, which is not a Christian country, um, you should be a good citizen. <coughs> Dara, Dawa, things like that. That doesn't mean that you're, you're, you know, you don't have dissent. Thomas Jefferson said, "Dissent is the best. Dissent is the greatest form of patriotism." Right? So that's a form of being a good citizen that you have dissent if there are things that are wrong, but you don't do it in ways that are haram. Anyway, shurutu wujubi adai sum. The conditions that obligate one to fast. Okay, I'm not going to quote too much Arabic. The, the conditions that make it obligatory to fast Ramadan are obviously that you're Muslim, you're sane, you're mature, and you have knowledge of the fast. But then you have to be free from ill health. You don't have marad, you don't have a sickness or a disease. Uh, and also you're free from hayd, menstrual cycle which lasts a minimum of three days and a maximum of ten days. You're free from nifas, postnatal bleeding, after the woman gives birth, right? That lasts up to 40 days. And also iqama, you're a resident, right? You're not a traveler. You're a resident. If one is traveling and fasting is not compulsory, though if it is achievable, then it is better to undertake its performance more on fa uh, fasting when you're <coughs> traveling later. <coughs> Any questions so far, as far as if, comprehension? Yes. If we are on Umrah uh -huh. during Ramadan, so <coughs> fasting over there, we want to fast. So if you don't fast, that's okay over there? How long are you planning on being there? If it's more than 15 days, <coughs> as soon as you land, you have to fast. Oh, okay. Yeah. If less than 15 days, then? Yeah, if you're planning on staying less than 15 days, then you don't have to fast, you have an option. Mm. But it's always better to fast. Yeah, it's always better. The Hanafi scholars always say it's better to fast. But would, huh? would you also go into the fact or what? how do you do the kafara for if somebody's coming? Yeah, we're going to go into that in detail, inshallah. Yes, sir? Uh, in, uh, as, as, as you said, in, in the journey it is postponed and maybe completed later on. The Quran also says, now in, in, in some situation, like I'm traveling on June July 3rd, and uh, I have planned to start in 10, 1030, then in three, four hours I, I land, land. So in that case, I feel I am comfortable to be with fast and I can and travel as well. So is it, uh, is it acceptable or I have yeah, just... Per no, it's preferable to fast when you're traveling. Oh, okay. It's not a big hardship. Now, Ibn Abidin says, and this is from an advanced text, his opinion is that in order for you to um, break your fast when you're traveling, you have to have started that day at Fajr traveling. So you can't start as a muqim and then travel after Dhuhr and drive 50 miles and then start eating. That's his opinion. The other opinion is you can do that. We'll talk about that, inshallah. But it's always better to fast. Yeah. <coughs> And he talks about if you're in a group and you're the only one fasting, you should, you should always be with the group and things like that. We'll talk about that. Uh, it is not a condition to be free from sexual discharge. So let's say um, a man uh, has a nocturnal emission at night, right? And he wakes up and there's najasa on his body. Uh, his fast is sound, because <coughs> he has not eaten anything. All he has to do is 
take a shower and continue fasting. There's hadith in Abu Dawood related by Aisha anha, that the Prophet وسلم, would visit her uh, and they would have intercourse and the, he would go to sleep and then the adhan of Fajr would wake him up during Ramadan. So now it's time to fast, but he's in a state of janaba, greater ritual impurity. All he would do is simply take a shower and then continue fasting. You don't have to make it up. Okay. The outcome of fasting. The legal outcome that is derived from fasting is a compulsory obligation that one is obliged to perform is cleared and the individual is rewarded in the hereafter. And the will of Allah and Allah knows best. Now, this is important. Aqsamusam. Yanqasimusom in a sitati aqsam. There are six types of fasts. Six types of fasts. Okay. And, I'll, and again, let me know if there's any type of question that comes up during the course. I'm going to write these on the board, inshallah. I'm trying to use this black pen, write it in Arabic. Oh, this is much better. And I'll transliterate it. There is the fast that is fard, fard, right? If you're from <coughs> Persian or Urdu-speaking world, <coughs> fard. <right? laughs> fard means obligatory, mandatory fast, right? And then he says, there's wajib. Wajib, which also means mandatory. Now, what is the difference between fard and wajib? It's a big question. For the Shafi'is, it's almost no difference. It's, it's very minute. In the Hanafi school, there is a difference between a fard and a wajib. A fard is established by a Quranic ayah that is clearly understood, or by a hadith that is multiply trans transmitted. <coughs> That's called dalil qat'i. Dalil qat'i means a definitive proof text. Okay, so it says in the Quran directly something, and it's understood. Or the Prophet ﷺ, he said something and it's been transmitted through so many chains of transmission that it's impossible for this hadith to have been invented by somebody. Okay? So if you do something fault, you're rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's rewardable. We shouldn't say you will be rewarded. Allah will ma yasha, Allah does whatever he wants, but it's rewardable. If you don't do a fault, then it's punishable, it's sinful. Okay? And that's the same with wajib. If you do a wajib, right, it's rewardable. If you don't do it, it's sinful. But a wajib is not uh, established with a definitive proof text. It's based on a singular <coughs> attestation. For example, it's called khabar <coughs> al-had. Like there's a hadith, and it's a strong hadith, but it's not multiply attested. Like witr, right? In the Hanafi school, salat al witr is wajib. In the Shafi'i school is Sunnah. Okay? If you do witr, mashallah, it's rewardable. If you don't do it, it's sinful. So then what is the difference then? The difference is if you reject a fault, you have left Islam. If you reject a fault, if you say you don't have to fast in Ramadan, that was from back then, and you know, there people back then were collecting food because there's a shortage and there was a famine and you don't have to make wudu because people back then were dirty. I mean, I hear these things all the time. I go to school in Berkeley. <laughs> I have to deal with people like this all the time. So that's actually kufur, according to the Hanafi school. Right? If you reject a fall, if you reject a wajib, then you're still Muslim, but you're a fasiq. You're a sinner, according to the Hanafi school. Okay, you guys see the difference there? And then you have fast that is masnoon. Masnoon, um, that's, there's no harm in doing that. There's no harm in doing that. Yeah. You can certainly do that. Make it sort of unconditional. Yeah? Like some people are sick or for anyone in Muslim community or in family, just 
the sister said, uh, very, very badly sick. So I can make the intention, Ya Allah, if this person or child or get, get health, healthy and I, I will uh, pay sadaqa or, or fasting or something. Yes. So, but in some cases it does not happen. So you don't have to do it then. If you make a conditional, if, yeah, if, if there's a shalt, if there's a condition, Allah, if you do this, then I'll do that. If Allah doesn't do that, then you don't have to fulfill it. You can do it as a service. You know, you can do it as an extra ibadah, mm -hmm. you know, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And an and extra dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, dua is efficacious. Dua can change what's written on the lower. Right? So we should always be in a state of dua. At dua, mukhul ibadah. There's a hadith that dua is the essence of worship. And people leave the essence sometimes. You don't make dua. We're too lazy to go like this. Anyway. So, let's talk about, so, these are the three types of fall fasts. Ramadan, as well as Qadha, right? Or expiation fast, kafara. Or, if you make another, if you make an, an oath, whether it's specific or non-specific, whether conditional or not, you have to do it. Now, what happens if you break your fast? So, I'm going to just sort of put these words over here. So, khata'an means accidentally. Accidentally. What happens if you're fasting in Ramadan and you break your fast accidentally? Let's say that you're uh, making wudu and it's very hot and you're rinsing your mouth out and then the reflex takes over and you swallow some water. So what do you have to do? Continue. You have to continue fasting. It's wajib to continue. But do you have to make qadha? Do you have to make it up? Oh, the answer yeah. is yes, you do have to make it up. Do you have to do expiation? No, you don't. There's no expiation. If you break your fast accidentally, make up the day. You can't eat again during that day. You have to stop. It was an accident, but you can't continue. It's wajib to stop. Okay? Um, and then you have to make it up after Ramadan sometime. No kafara. What happens? You, yeah. Sorry. No, no, sorry. What if you just accidentally eat something and you, before swallowing you remember and then you just spit it? Then? So it, it depends if it passes the. Only if it passes the. Yeah, if it passes the throat here. Then there's no keep making it up. Then <coughs> yeah, as long as you can. As long as you can get it out without it reaching Stop. the stomach. Oh, okay. Yes. And I don't Stop. want to drag this thing, but. No, it's okay. But if you, oh, this is not the month of Ramadan, and let's say you're fasting on Monday, Thursday, and uh -huh. it happened during that time, yeah. the same rules apply? Uh, yes, you have to make it. If you spoil a nafila fast, it's wajib to make it up. It's not fall, it's wajib. We'll talk about that also. It's a little bit different. But let's say you're fasting Ramadan, and you forgetfully eat. You forgot it was Ramadan. You wake up, you make a five-star breakfast. And you eat all of it, and then you say, oh, stop for Allah, okay. after you're done eating. Okay, you stop. What's that? The same thing. You stop first we realize that you forgot, and yes. then without counting everything, and then you make it up. After. Don't have to make it up. You don't? You don't have to make it up. You forgot. The Prophet ﷺ said, if any of you eats during Ramadan, nasiyan, Allah fed you. Take it as a blessing. <laughs> you don't have to. If you forget completely. So this is different than khata'an, right? Oh, yeah. When you're doing khata'an, you know no, you're fasting, yeah. but it was an accident. Yeah. But here you totally forgot. Okay. So there's no qada, no kafara. No matter if, if, even if you have a huge buffet meal, 
Or, or sometimes people don't even find out if Ramadan has started. Like some one time, yeah. five years ago, it happened. Yeah. And uh, people had their breakfast, then they got a call from a friend that today, first Ramadan, and she said she just had her breakfast. Okay. They have to make it up. That's Yom Shak. We'll talk about Yom Shak. that they have doubt. You have to be very careful about that day. You can't just wake up and start eating and say, if it's Ramadan, if it's Ramadan, if not, I didn't hear anything. You can't do that. It's called Yom Shak. Well, we're going to talk about that, inshallah. Um, okay, so that's if you forget. Now, what if you intentionally eat? You're not being forced. You do it out of your free will. There's no coercion. You eat. You have to make up that day, and you have to do kafar. Okay? These are the distinctions. I have a question on the second one. Yes. Second one. When you say you have to have a five star, uh, you know, breakfast or what have you. Yeah. Uh, this is before sunrise or after sunrise? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you because forgot. Normally you will do the before su uh, sunrise. No, before sunrise, obviously. Yeah. Well, uh, no, 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 after sunrise, before sundown, yeah. during the fasting period. Yeah. Let's say you just wake up and have breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. In the middle of your breakfast, you realize it's Ramadan. If there's food in your mouth, take it out. Do not induce vomit. Don't vomit, but if there's food in your mouth, take it out and wash your mouth out. Khalas, you're okay. So, Continue fasting, you don't have to make it up. So isn't forgetting and not knowing the same thing? I mean, I'm trying to find no. a yeah. fine point between that. Not math. knowing at all. Because, because you have shift. not started the fast yet. Huh? You have not started the fast. No, no because no. there was no uh, ruling, no mm. announcement for the Ramadan that is going to start tomorrow or day after. Oh, somebody totally forgot. Mm. Yeah, but they should be more responsible that it didn't, yeah. they didn't know that no, it started. No, not forget. They didn't hear the news. They slept till 12 and there was no news. After 12, some, uh, someone found out the drama. So people fasted, but that person didn't find out after 12. She was sleeping. But did that person think it might have been Ramadan? Uh, yeah, this is the case. Then if I the person thinks it might be Ramadan, they cannot eat. You should That's have possible. called before. And they have to do, they have to, they have to do investigation. Oh, okay. And usually the Qadi will do that. And they have to tell the people before Zawal. Because that's when the intention ends for Ramadan. Well, we'll talk about that. Mm. Yeah. Um, one, one, yes. Um, years ago, I remember hearing this, that oh, if you have a husband who's very fussy about how the food tastes, and then yes. the wife is cooking and takes it, tastes it to see yeah. if it's pleasing to him. Yeah, Anything yeah he mentions that. So yeah. it's makru tahriman, to taste anything during Ramadan. Makru tahriman, to taste. And taste means you taste it, but you don't swallow it. You just put it in your mouth and you spit it. Except... A woman who's cooking food and her husband has a temper, and if he, you know, the food is too salty, he he might beat her or something like that. So she, it's mubah, it's, it's permissible for her to taste it without swallowing. Allah won't accept his fast <laughs> if he beats her. <laughs> Allah but obviously exactly. beating your wife is haram. So that's that's you know people do that sometimes. It's like filling up a car with gas that has flat tires. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <coughs> okay. And then people sometimes you make that an excuse too. Like, oh, she wears hijab? She's a terrible person. Why should I wear it? Your hijab wearing has nothing to do with that person. That's between you and Allah. This person fasts, he beats his wife. Why should I fast? Who is this person that you're idolizing? Who cares? This is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Now, the wajib fast. What is the wajib fast? A wajib fast is... When you break a voluntary <coughs> fast, if you break, ruin a voluntary fast, it's wajib for you to make up that voluntary fast. Do you understand? So let's say, what's a voluntary fast? For example, uh, Yawmi Ashura, the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. This is a sunnah fast, which is voluntary, right? So you're fasting Yawmi Ashura, and you're at work, and it's your birthday. Your co-workers come into your office and say, Happy birthday, here's a cake. You cut the cake and take the first bite. Since this is an optional fast, you can break your fast for any reason. Okay? You can say, I'm fasting, and try to explain it to them. Uh, if it's Ramadan, you have to say that. If you're doing a wajib fast, you have to say that. But if it's an optional fast, you can say, Okay, I'm going to eat. But you have to make it up. It's wajib. It's not followed, it's wajib to make it up. Spoil, spoiling, a nafila fast, a sunnah fast, a mandub fast, 
If you spoil any types, any one of these fasts, masnun, mandub, nafila. If you spoil them at any time during the day, it's wajib to make it up. No kafara. No kafara. No kafara no is only for Roman okay. fasts. But isn't it better to continue and not to make it up because it's very hard to make up? I mean, why would intentionally? Yeah, you know, if, if, if yeah. fasting is difficult for you, you should continue. If you want to explain it, because people sometimes, in, in the in the work situation, they bring in the food and they say, ah, okay, we'll just start. <laughs> they don't want to explain things, and it's how to make it up later. It's it's your option. You can break your fast for any reason, mm -hmm. as long as it's not a wajib okay. or fault. Mm -hmm. You can break it for any reason. The Prophet said, is a hadith that he woke up in the morning, he looked around the house, and he said, Aisha, is there anything to eat? She said, there's nothing to eat. He said, Anna saw him, I'm fasting then. Later in the day, some haze, some type of good food was brought, and he started eating. He said, I'm not going to pass this up. I can fast later. <laughs> I thought that was only in Christianity, because in Christianity, they, they, they make an intention, then they, if something comes up, they say, okay, I'll eat now. And I'll continue. I thought that was only because we had some friend and I was in a situation where I knew she was fasting. And then we went for a breakfast and they said, oh, I'm fasting, but I'm not going to let go of this breakfast. So she ate and then she continued. No, we, have, then, we have that. It's an it's a optional fast. So you don't have to fast that day. So even if you made an intention, <coughs> you have to make it up later. So you're not leaving it completely. You're so just you delaying it. it okay. You're just going to delay it. Mm -hmm. You're not leaving it totally. And this is based on the hadith in the verse 4733 in the Quran, Abu Hanifa's proof text. La a'malakum. Don't spoil or cancel your deeds. 4733. This is not so in the Shafi'i school, by the way. The Shafi'i school, if you break a nafila fast, you don't have to make it up. Right? Is my understanding. Now, what are the, the sunnah fasts? Sunnah. The sunnah fast is Yomi Ashura. And also the ninth. So you fast the tenth of Muharram, you also have to either do the ninth or the eleventh. So you don't isolate Ashura. Understand? And that's Sunnah. Okay? Ninth and tenth or tenth and eleventh. Exactly. Ninth and tenth or tenth and eleventh. So we have to come we have to make two continuously. Continuously, yes. Yes, yeah, this is Ashura plus the Ganakajas. Yes. Yes, 9th and 10th or 10th and 11th. Exactly. It's a hadith in Muslim. The Prophet sent a person on the morning of Ashura to the villages of the Ansar around Medina with this message He who got up in the morning fasting without eating anything should complete his fast, and he who had not, and he who had breakfast in the morning should complete the rest of the day without food. And the companions observed that. So this is a sunnah, right? A sunnah fast. Wa'amal mandub, as far as mandub, which is known as mustahab, so totally optional. What are the totally optional fasts? Sawmu thalathati min kulli shahrin. And they're called al-ayamul bi'id. So, three days fasting in every month is mandub. Okay? Pick three days in the month and fast on them. The best of those three days are called the white days, which are usually, as he says, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, when the moon is the strongest, the Prophet would fast on those days. But this is mandub. This is totally optional. If you want to, fine. If not, you don't have to. However, the Prophet he said, whoever does that has the reward of one who has som ad-dahar, like someone who's fasting every day. Three days a month, it's like you fast in the reward, Abu Dawood Hadith. It's like you're fasting every day. And by the way, fasting every day is actually makruh. But you'll have that reward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just read this just a couple of days ago about this, um, what you just mentioned. So when I was finding out about fasting on the 13th, 14th, 15th of the Shaban, about the white days, so I was reading came across this yes. hadith. But this has nothing to do with Shaban, you think? Any, any every month any, you can do any, any, month. Yes. Yeah. any month. Pick three days. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's mandub, three days, and then there's the mandub of the mandub. There's the most desirable of the desirable, and that is the, the white days, 13, 14, 15. Could, could, I, could I have so, something to say? Please observe the 
discipline of the meeting. If somebody is asking question and 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 the it is answering, don't interrupt me. Well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. No, I want to be interactive. Just I don't say I'm not offended. This is getting confused. No, 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 it's okay. You can go ahead. Don't worry about it. If everybody started doing like this, where do you go then? Where no, that's right. Okay. We'll get through the text. I want people to, because there are issues that I want them to, to ask. Yeah, don't worry about that. Actually, this is a question answer session. And also yeah, it was advertised as QA. I mean, we, we're loosely based on the text, but really it's more of a so I'm sort of reading this to kind of get you to ask, ask questions, questions, actually. And if you don't want to ask, that's fine. Sit and relax and listen if you want to take um, notes. A quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, for, for people that have days to make up for uh -huh. Ramadan, for instance, mm -hmm. very often people say, well, wait till November or December. The days are short. That's okay? But it's okay to do that, yeah. But not recommended? It's, it's not recommended, yeah. It's permissible to do that, but it's makru to delay a, a fall. Mm -hmm. It's just like when the prayer time comes in, you have some time, like if the Dhuhr comes in, you say, oh, I have three hours, I'll just finish playing my game, and then I'll pray Dhuhr later. It's in, it's in your intention. It's permissible, but a makru. You should really do things when they're due. Right? Unless it's just a hardship, like fasting is difficult. Maybe you have a mild case of diabetes or something, and, it's, and you just want a shorter day, so you wait till December, inshallah, you'll be okay. Because December, I mean, I think Uftar is like... 4.30 or something like that. <laughs> much, much easier. Everything's relative, though. Even in December, people are like, oh, I'm hungry. It's all relative. <laughs> so for the making of fast, yeah. so you can fast the whole month of okay. December continuously, yeah. or it has to be like in a day or something? Um, yeah, you can, you, can, uh, you can do a month, yeah. You can do a month cons consistently. As long as you don't run into an aid. You have to be careful. We'll talk about that, too. Fasting on Eid is a no-no. Yeah, but you can you can do a month like that. The best fast is the fast of Dawood mm -hmm. Salaam, stated in Hadith. The most beloved fast is a Hadith of the Prophet Salaam. The most beloved fast is the fast of the Prophet David. We fast one day and not fast. Fast until the body was never habituated to fasting. It's always a struggle, right? We'll talk about that inshallah. Okay, going back to recommended fast. Another recommended fast. Some would its name what Khamis. Fasting on Mondays and Thursdays of each week is a recommended fast. The Prophet said, The works of his servants are presented to Allah on Mondays and Thursdays. So I like that my works, when my works are presented, I'm fasting. This is Hadith al Tirmidhi. Mondays and Thursdays, our deeds are presented. And of course, Allah knows our deeds, right? But this is a way of getting us to focus on those days. There's something special about those days. Thursday, obviously, the day before Juma. Monday, Yom Wudi Tufi. The Prophet says, someone was asked one time, why are you fasting on Mondays? He didn't give this answer. He didn't say, because my deeds are being presented. He said, what? This is the day I was born. <laughs> so he's commemorating his own birth by fasting. Also on Thursday, in a sound hadith, sound hadith of Al-Bazzar, Tu'radu alayya amalakum. Your deeds, the Ummah, are presented to the Prophet sallallahu فَإِنْ وَجَدْتُوا خَيْرًا حَمِدْتُ اللَّهُ وَإِنْ وَجَدْتُوا غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ أَوْ شَرًا أَسْتَغْفَرْتُ لَكُمْ If I see good, so he, he gets some sort of a report from the angels about what his ummah is doing, right? He's not, he's not forgiving sins or anything like that. That's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I see good, I praise God. If I see other, I ask Allah to forgive you. Do you understand? This is not shirk. This is sound hadith, by the way. Totally sound hadith. It's accepted by it. All of the ulama globally, by ijma' of the ulama. But if I say al-bazaar, I say, oh, that's not in Bukhari, Muslim, so it must not be a real hadith. But no, it's a sound hadith. Okay? People say, how can... In the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he says, if you said salawat upon me on Fridays, I can hear it with my own ear. And somebody will say, what does that mean? You're making him into a god. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the mushrikeen at Badr were buried and they were under the ground, he started speaking to them. And he said, Ya Ahl al Qadim, Hal wajadtum ma wa'adakum rabbukum haqqan, fa inni wajadtum ma wa'adani rabbi haqqan. He said, Oh, people of the pit, did you find what your Lord promised you to be true? Indeed, I found what my Lord promised me to be true. And then Omar said, These are dead. They can't hear you. And he said, Your hearing of my voice is not better than theirs. 
If mushrikeen, who are killed by Sahaba, can hear the voice of the Prophet under the earth, then what about the Habib of God? What can he hear in his grave? Think about it. It doesn't mean he's all hearing. It's all from Allah. Allah hears everything. But he can hear things. The Prophet said, a normal Muslim, maybe he's a sinner. He's six feet under. He can hear the footsteps going away from his grave. Can you imagine how, how piercing that hearing is? That's a normal Muslim. What about the Prophet What can he hear? Different. Do yes. they only hear the day they are buried or whenever we visit the No, grave? when they visit, they become aware. Uh -huh. Yes. If you come visit them, they become aware of that. Uh -huh. their, their sight, their, their senses are more keen than when, when we are here. It's, it's more keen. Uh -huh. Yes. There was a woman who used to clean the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu in Muratu Sauda, she, she was called, there was a black woman who used to, who used to clean the masjid. And uh, she died. And uh, they buried her, and no one told the Prophet. So he was sitting in the masjid one time. He said, Where's that woman who cleans my masjid? And he said, Who are you talking about? He said, Where? That woman that cleans my masjid. He said, Oh, she, I don't know. I guess I think. What happened? They asked around, she died. And he was very, very upset at the Sahaba. He said, oh, you deemed her insignificant, didn't you? But you don't know what she was. So then he went to her grave and prayed for her. You can imagine she's in her grave, and she hears someone coming. Who is the one coming to her grave? So, and she becomes aware of that. So, yes? In the Quran, Allah says, uh, in the grave, the dead bodies do not hear, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them to hear. Of course, Allah makes it, yes. وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ uh, What is the verse? In Surah Al-Zumar. You're not one to make people hear, but Allah makes those who are in their ubur to hear. Yes. Of course, Allah does everything. That's what's in the power. Anyway. Is there some kind of question? Okay. So Mondays and Thursdays? Mandub. It's a mustahab. Uh, it's a desirable fast. Extra credit. وَصَوْمُ سِتَّ مِنْ شَوَالٍ ثُمَّ قِيلَ الْأَفْضَلُ وَصْلُهَا وَقِيلَ تَفْرِيقُهَا Fasting six days in the month of Shawal is highly recommended. Six days, what's Shawal? The tenth month after Ramadan. I'm sorry, tenth month? Tenth month yeah. of Ramadan, after Ramadan. So Ramadan is ninth and tenth. Right? So six days, and some of the ulama say you have to do it um, consecutively. That's one opinion. And that's what he says, it's al-afdal, that's the best opinion. Other ulama say, just pick six days in shawal. Any six days. So both of them are correct. Another opinion says, begin at shawal, and the whole rest of the year pick six days. But that's a minority opinion. Al-afdal is right after Eid al-Fitr, because you cannot fast on Eid. Beginning on the second of shawal, you fast second, third, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Right? Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Right? So, where I studied in, in, in Yemen, the Ba'alawi there, the entire city, right after Eid al Fitr, everyone's fasting again for six days. Everyone's, it's just like Ramadan, shops are closed. And then on the eighth of Shawwal, there's like another little Eid. Some say this is Bid'ah, but that's what they do, inshallah. But like you said the other day, they're a good Bid'ah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, that, and that's really an encouragement for other people to do that. Right? So it's, inshallah, good bit. These are early money, the first rate. So they but, know what they're doing. Yes. Uh, some of the explanation I read, uh, they say that after the Eid, you must have second of Shawwal. You must have second of Shawwal. And five, five, rest, and five days you can complete any, any days in Shabbat. The second of Shabbat, what? You, you can't you fast. fast? You have to fast. You mm -hmm. fast for the one day and then you can do the five later or something. But you have to fast on second of Shabbat. It's a must. No, no. This, this is Mandu. Either way you want to do. That might be a cultural thing. Yeah. Like, if you, like, again, if you go to Tanim, it's almost, you feel like you have to do it. But in reality, it's Mandu. The shed, according to the shed. May I add, that's then they're Shafi'i, so I can't speak for the Shafi'i. But the Hanafi school, six days of Shawal is totally optional. 
You start on the 2nd, you have until the 29th or 30th, you can pick any six days, but Al-Afdal is 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. It's also recommended, and he says here, to do the fast of Dawood Highly recommended, and highly rewardable. The most beloved fast of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fast of Dawood, where you would fast one day, break his fast the other day. Fast one day, not fast. Fast, not fast. Fast, not fast. <clears throat> and that's a hadith in Muslim. So as for the voluntary fast, uh, so anything, he says, anything that we did not mention that's Mandub, Masnoon, Wajib, or Fard. If it's not one of those, and it's not a Makru day, then it's a Nafila day. Okay? So let's say you want to fast a random Tuesday, right? It's not Monday or Thursday. It's not Yomi Ashura, right? It's not one of the white days. It's just a random Tuesday that you want to fast. Okay, that's good. It's Nafila. Extra credit. For, for Nafil, a fasting or not the wajib fasting, waking up for sahur also has the same reward as Ramadan, uh, eating sahur in Ramadan. Everything in Ramadan is multiplied, yeah. so and it's not the same reward. Sahur is... is but it's mustahab, okay. yeah, it's rewardable. It's mustahab to eat sahur. But anafila in Ramadan is the reward of fard. So everything is multiplied exponentially in the month of Ramadan. So make sure you don't leave out any sunnah, because yeah, those are mandatory. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so that's a voluntary fast. Now, looking at makru. Okay, there's one type of fast. There's um, one type of makru, which is called makru tanzihan. Makru tanzihan, somewhat disliked. And then we have makru tahriman, prohibitively disliked. He deals with al awwal. Somewhat disliked. What is somewhat disliked? To fast Yomi Ashura Munfaridan and it tasir. To fast the day of Ashura by itself and not fasting the 9th or the 11th. This is Makru Tanzihan to do that. Okay? Now let's say that you had an intention. You said you're going to do. Uh, I think it died. Uh, fasted the day of Ashura, and you had an intention of doing the 11th, but you're just so wiped out. Inshallah, you'll have your reward, inshallah. You have your niyyah. But you shouldn't simply intend, I'm going to do Yomi Ashura, and that's it. Try to intend to do another day. That's why it's better to do the 9th. Because if you do the 9th, then you sort of have to, you have to do the 10th, all right? That's the point of it, right? Is this because Prophet Sallallahu used to want to, to have something different from what Jews used to do? Yeah, it's probably for a political reason. He found that the Bani Israel and Yathrib that were fasting on Yomi Ashura, which was Yom Kippur mm -hmm. at that time, the tenth of the first day of the Hebrew calendar is called the Asarabi Tishri, which is Yom Kippur, right? Uh, so he said, uh, we have a greater claim on Moses, so let's also fast mm -hmm. this day, but also to differentiate ourselves from them, mm -hmm. to show our greater respect for Musa alayhi salam mm -hmm. and the tradition of, of the Israelite <coughs> prophets. Let's also fast an additional day. And he said that, uh, he said, if I'm alive next year, I'll do the ninth, but then he passed. And that's in Abu Dawood. So, so if, you, if you intend to fast from 10th and 11th, mm -hmm. then you fast from 10th, and for some reason you cannot do it 11th, then does that fast become wajib on you then? Or still, does it make sense? So if you intended to fast the 11th? Yeah, and for some reason you can't. What will it happen to be? I'm just want to know, do, do, do you need to fast then to make up for what you intended to do? Like some of the other fasts that you talked about? Or you yeah. can say, well... Yeah, if you had a, a firm intention that you're going to fast and you did not, you have to make it up. Okay. Even if you didn't eat anything, you have to make it up. Uh, I, mean, I mean, if you, if you, hold on a second. If, if you fast, if you made an intention, uh, and you didn't fast yet, so you have to make qadha off that day. So let's, yeah, let's take a break. Let's take a, one, one more question, then we'll take a break. Yes. Yeah. And the question of Barat, uh, the Friday, versus uh -huh. effort, somebody say, if you take Friday, you should be take two days. Yeah, that's true, that's also, yeah, he mentions that also as one of the, 
uh, makruh fast is to pray Jum'ah by its, uh, to fast on Jum'ah by itself. You should always join it with something else. Join it with the Thursday before or the Saturday after. It's makruh to do it by itself, yes. And Saturday also. It's makruh to do Saturday by itself. Yeah, so basically it's a reprehensible innovation because Juma is a blessed day. But to fast by itself, it's like you're inventing an ibadah that is not sanctioned. It has the sort of form of, of something that is not sanctioned by sacred law. So it's considered a reprehensible bid'ah. It's not haram, but it's makru. And also Saturday, to, again, to differentiate from uh, the Bani Israel, the Yom Sabt. You should always join Saturday with the Friday. You can do Friday and Saturday. Or uh, Saturday with Sunday. So yeah, the day of Nisu Shaban was on a Friday. Nisu Shaban is a nafila fast. Mm. It's nafila. Uh, so you should join that with another, with another day. If you didn't, inshallah, you have the reward, inshallah. So don't stress about it. Okay, we'll take a few minute break. Five minute break. 13th of the Hijjah. Yes. Somebody after uh, the Eid is in Ramadan, after one day Eid, they start Shashag, you know, like the six day. Is it right? Or no, after three day after Eid, should be Eid? No, Eid, Eid al-Adha, you, have, you Eid can't. Adha. So Eid al-Fitr is just one what? day, the first of Shawwal. Yeah. And the second of Shawwal, you can begin your, your fasting. Yes. No, the three days after Eid al-Adha yeah. is makru Shahriman, yeah. not after Eid al-Fitr. So these five days. And he mentions here also Ifrad Yom al you know, singling out Friday, reprehensible innovation. Don't single out Friday. You want to fast on a Friday, fast also the Thursday before or the Saturday after, or at least intend to do that. Ifrad Yom Sabt, it's dislike to single out Saturday. Unless, unless, let me just finish one part. Unless it's one of the regular days that you fast. Let's say that Friday is uh, um, one of the six days of Shawwal. Obviously, you're going to do that in a row anyway. Or Friday is one of the white days, I am will be. Right? So if it's part of your habit. Or let's say that you have the habit of fasting one day and not fasting the other day. You're doing the fast of Dawood. So you're not actually connecting Friday with Thursday. That's okay, because that's part of your adat. That's part of your habit to do that. You don't have to break your fast of Dawood. And that goes with Friday and Saturday. Yes, sir? Uh, so, we, you know, we have basically this conflict in terms of you know, people observe Eid on different days of the week. Right? Yeah. So if, if there is, you know, some portion of Omar is observing an Eid, but you, you know, according to how you basically follow, your Eid may be the, the day after that, right? So your Ramadan hasn't ended. So you are fasting while part That's of your okay. is basically... Because you're taking ijtihad, you're taking an opinion. See, the point isn't to be exactly right with down to the fourth decimal point. That's not really the point. The point is to follow the sunnah as best you can, as interpreted by mujtahidi, by scholars of Islam. So it won't be considered actually fasting on the day of Eid according no, to... No, because you're following your own methodology. That's totally valid. You can't go wrong with sunnah. The Prophet says, some did not calculate the moon cycle. You can do that. The Tabi'in did that. The Tabi'in actually did that. They were, some of them were incredible. But the Prophet says, some did do it. Whatever the Prophet says, did, that's the best. Following Sunnah, even if you're wrong, you're right. If you calculate things, you could be wrong. Maybe you're off by it. You didn't carry the one. <laughs> Following the Sunnah, even if you're wrong, you're right. Because you follow the right methodology. It's all about ikhlas. You know, we shouldn't be trying to get things down perfectly. So we'll, we'll talk about that too. You know, how do you cite the moon and things like that, inshallah. Okay, so we have to get moving here. It's also prohibitively dislike to fast on Nauruz, which is a Persian holiday, uh, or Eid al-Bilad, Christmas, Eid al-Qiyamah, Easter, anything like that. Unless it's coinciding with one of your regular fast days. So if your intention isn't to fast on Christmas, Christmas happens to fall on Thursday, and you fast on Mondays and Thursdays. So, 
So you, you're not going to say, well, it's Christmas, I'm not going to fast now on this Thursday. No, you fast, that's okay. But if your intention is, I want to celebrate Christmas by fasting, this is, some of the Roman may even say this is cool for to do that, but definitely reprehensible bidah. Right? It is disliked to perform continuous fast, somul we saw. Somul we saw means you keep fasting, you never break your fast. Two, three days at a time, you're not eating or drinking. This is prohibitively disliked. Well, no, you main, even if you do for two days. Okay? The Prophet was doing this, and the companion said, came to him and said, this is what you're doing, we're going to do it. And he said, I am not like you. My constitution is different. I am supplied with food and water by my Lord. Whatever that means. Right? But he used to do that. Uh, but he said, that's, that's his prerogative. There are certain things for the Prophet that are not for the mu'minin at large. He had more than four wives. We can't do that. No one can marry his wives after him. That doesn't apply to any of us. Right? He can't accept sadaqah. He has to pray his wajib, a third of the night, the hajjud. He has to do it. One third of the night to prayer. Right? Sleeping does not break his wudu. That breaks our wudu. Right? He said, in the aineya tanamani wa qalbi la yanam. My eyes are asleep and my heart is awake. Right? That's why when he's sleeping, the man came to kill him, he opened his eyes. Because he saw him coming. <laughs> That's when he's flying over, you know, to Jerusalem. He saw Musa alayhi salam with great detail praying in his grave. If he's moving at the speed of light, how can you describe him? Because he saw him with his heart. He didn't see him with his eyes and stop, let me take a picture and he just, it, he perceived what was happening. Right? <clears throat> it is disliked to fast for one's entire life. Right? This is called Soma Dahar. Right? To fast every single day. It, because it's, uh, the purpose is Jihad al Nafs. And uh, you, it's to habituate yourself to that. It's missing the point of fasting. And it also makes you very, very weak in your old age and feeble. So, remember, the hadith of Abu Dawood, fast the 13th, 14th, and 15th of the month, or three days of every month, and you'll have the reward of Saul and Dahar, like you fast every day. Okay, now, he's talking about intention here. When do we make the intention for the Ramadan fast? Okay, so when we're fasting Ramadan, our fast, our intention is made, we have a time frame. From Maghrib, right, the night before the day, up until Zawal, the day of the fast, we have time to form an intention. Okay? What is the intention? A firm result, a firm resolve in the heart. And you don't have to be specific. You don't have to have ta'yeen and say, oh, I'm fasting because for such and such a reason. Just have a firm resolve in the heart uh, that you're fasting. So, and this is also with respect to nafila, the nafila fast, nafila and any of these other fasts, the, uh, the wajib, no I'm sorry, the far, the, the sunnah, masnoon, mandu, and nafila, you have time to make intention up until zawal. What is zawal? When the sun reaches its meridian, right, its height, the zenith. And it begins its descent. So just before, before Duhr prayer. So for example, the Prophet وسلم, in the hadith of Muslim, he woke up one day, I mentioned this, he looked around his house. He didn't eat anything when he woke up. He got up, he looked around his house. He said, Ya Aisha, is there anything to eat? There's nothing to eat. I'm fasting. That's a nafila fast. Okay? Now this doesn't really apply to Ramadan. Let's say in Ramadan, a person forgot it was Ramadan. Okay? He forgot it was Ramadan. He did not make his intention the night before. Now he wakes up, right? And the and the time of Zawal has passed. Okay, let's say that he's sitting around, he just hasn't eaten all day. He has no intention of fasting. And he hears the Adhan for Dhuhr. And suddenly he remembers, oh, it's Ramadan. Then he thinks, did I eat anything? Oh, I didn't eat anything, so I'm fasting. No, it doesn't count. He has to make that day up. 
You understand? Because he didn't make his intention before Zawal. You have to have a firm intention. If he did it the night before and then he forgot when he woke up, right, then he's okay. Because he already made his intention the night before. But let's say the night before he didn't make his intention either. When he woke up, he didn't make his intention. When he hears it, Avan for Vohor, even if he didn't eat anything, he has to make Qadha of that day. It's too late. Exactly. <coughs> let's say that he ate before his intention. He forgot, right? He woke up, he has no intention of fasting, he starts eating, right? He has to make up that day because he didn't have an intention. If he did have an intention, and he starts eating, and he forgot, and he just starts eating, then he doesn't have to do anything, like we said. Right? He made the intention, he forgot, he starts eating. Oh, it's Ramadan, I already made my intention. Yeah. Stop eating, you don't have to make Qadha. You don't have to make it up. But you have to stop eating, even if you're eating up. That's why it's start. You have to, it's wajib to stop. If you continue to eat, then you have to make Qadha. There's no kafara. Uh, you don't have to make kafara. But it's makru tahliman to continue eating. So very sinful to do that. But there's no kafar if you forgot and then you keep eating. Okay, so in summary here, if you're performing Ramadan, if you're performing a farad fast, right? Ramadan or qada, or you made a, an oath, you made a vow, nadrun, that you're going to fast, then you have up until Zawal of that day to form a firm intention. Okay? If it's a Nafila fast or Masnoon or Mandub, you also have up until the Zawal of that day to form your firm intention. Okay, now, fasts that require you to be specific and to do it at night. Okay? So, making up Ah, making up a unperformed Ramadan. I'm sorry, so what I, forget about what I said a, a minute ago. If you're doing Qadha of a past Ramadan, okay, you have to form your intention the night before, and you have to be specific in your intention. In other words, you have to say, I'm fasting because of that whatever day of Ramadan I missed. You have to keep track of days. That's what it means. Right? So if you're making Qadha, if you're making up a past Ramadan that you missed, you cannot wait until Fajr time. Your intention has to be before Fajr, Maghrib Isha time. Form your intention firmly and be specific. You have to have ta'yin. This is for that eighth day of Ramadan, or for the first day that I missed of Ramadan. And in case the person forgot exactly how many days he missed, you have to estimate. Make an estimation. Also, when one is making up a ruined voluntary fast. So what is that? That's a wajib fast, right? So you fast nafil and then you decide to break it for whatever reason. Now you have to make it up. When you're making it up, your intention has to be at night and it has to be specific. Also, the expiation fasts, kafara. If you want to do fasting for kafara, 60 straight days, all of those have to be at night with ta'yin. Firm intention, this is day one, this is day two, this is day three. Okay. okay. So, sighting of the moon. Subutu hilali Ramadan. Yathbutu Ramadan bi ru'yati hilalihi. Aw ba'd shabat, aw ba'd shabat thalathin. In huma hilal. Ramadan is established when the moon is sighted. And if the moon is not visible, they are to complete the month of Sha'ban as 30 days and then begin fasting. The Prophet said, Fast when you see it and break your fast when you see it. And if the weather is cloudy, reckon Sha'ban as 30 days. Sahih Muslim. So remember, a month is either 29 or 30 days. Right? So the day. The 29th day, let's say it's the 29th day of Sha'bat. Okay? So now Maghrib is coming. So now it's either the 30th night of Sha'ban or the first night of Ramadan. Right? And the day after that is called Yom Ashek. 
the day of doubt. The day of doubt. Right? Do you guys understand? So, the 29th day of Shabbat is past, now it's Maghrib. This Maghrib is either the first night of Ramadan, because the day starts at night. It's either the first night of Ramadan, or it's the 30th of, of Shabbat. So what do you do? It is disliked to fast during this day, except a voluntary fast, that one is firm about with no wavering between it and other fasts. The day of doubt is not to be performed as a fast on the belief that it is Ramadan. Rather, it is observed as a voluntary fast. So it's impermissible for you to say, if it's Ramadan tomorrow, I'm fasting. If not, I'm not. I'm just not going to eat. And that's your intention the whole day long. That's because you have to be firm in your intention. What you can do is make a firm intention for a nafila fast. And if it turns out to be Ramadan, then that intention will suffice you. But you can't say if or. You can't do that. You can't waver in intention. Make an intention of nafila. Okay? And then if it turns out to be Ramadan, then that intention will suffice you. If you make an intention that it is Ramadan, right, and it turns out to be Ramadan, then that's okay. If you make an intention that it is Ramadan, and that's makru to do that because you don't know, and it doesn't turn out to be Ramadan, then it's counted as a nafila fast. The best thing to do in this situation is to not make your intention at all, wake up in the morning, don't eat anything, investigate and see if the moon was spotted. You have until the whole time. And then, if you find reliable information that the moon was sighted last night, begin fasting. You can even eat your suhoor if you like. Right? Because if you make that intention of nafila, and then it doesn't turn out to be Ramadan, and you break your fast, you have to make it up. Remember, breaking a nafila requires a qadah, it's wajib. You can eat your suhoor even after the sun. You find out like 8 o'clock in the no, morning. No, 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 eat your suhoor before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So your intention is, I'm fasting nafila, <coughs> I'm eating my suhoor. If it turns out to be Ramadan, your intention is fine. Your intention will, will suffice for Ramadan. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or, eat your, eat, you can have suhoor, but you're not making an intention of fasting. You're just happening to eat suhoor. But you're going to say, I'm going to wait until Dhuhr to make my intention. Because I want to do some investigation. So you look on the internet, you call the sheikh, you know, you call your friends, you know, was there a moon sighting? Right? And they say, yes, it was sighted. Okay, continue fasting. Then you make your intention firm. Yeah. Is it recommended to not fast in the, the second half of Shaban? That's a Shafi'i opinion. Or, uh, the Hanafi opinion is that it's makru to fast one or two days before Ramadan uh, for the awam, for like the laity. But for the khawas, it says they should, they should fast. Because they can make a distinction between in their intentions. We'll, we'll talk about that. Could you, yes. could you repeat what you just said about laity and khat and awam? Yeah, so like the, the general people, uh -huh. they shouldn't fast a day or two before Ramadan. They shouldn't fast the 28th or 29th of Shabbat, or the 30th, if there is a 30th of Shabbat. They shouldn't do that. It's makru. But for the, for the elite, like for the scholars, there's nothing wrong with them doing that. Because they don't waver in their intention. They have more discipline. So, because we tend to think, oh, it's, um, you know, if it's Ramadan, if not, we, we, we get our intentions kind of crossed sometimes. And we can't do that. We have to have firm intention. Okay, uh, now, on the day of doubt, the Mufti orders the people to wait without their intention of fasting. Afterwards, when the time of intention expires, before midday, and the day did not appear as that of Ramadan, the Mufti orders the people to break their fast. In other words, to start, uh, to start eating. Right? That's why it's important to have contact with the ulama. Right? The best thing to do, again, is to... Wait off on your intention. You have until Zawal, the next day on the day of doubt, Yom Shek, and you can definitely find a confirmation by then. You'll find a confirmation by, by midnight the night before, at the latest, right? So it's not a difficult thing to do. Whoever sees the, month, uh, whoever sees the moon of Ramadan alone and his statement is rejected, he is required to fast on his own. So let's say there's a man 
he saw the moon, he go tells the Hadi or the Imam or the Sheikh, and the Sheikh says, No, you're that guy who always lies. For whatever reason, he's a facet. So the, she says, the Imam says, No, I don't I don't accept your opinion. That man has to fast by himself. Because he saw the moon. Right? Whoever sees the moon has to fast. Let him fast. But let's say that he saw the moon of Eid by himself. Okay? He saw the moon of Eid by himself. And his statement is rejected. He is not permitted to break his fast. He has to fast, even though he saw the moon, because now the community is involved. He can't celebrate Eid by himself. So if the judge rejects him, he has to go with the judge. You understand? Okay. Now, ver verification of the moon if there is an obstruction in the sky. So there's two ways of doing this. You can go by regional moon sighting or global moon sighting. Let's say, let's start with regional moon sighting. Okay. Regional moon sighting for Ramadan. If there's an obstruction in the sky, such as clouds or dust or something, the imam is to accept the testimony of a single upright witness or one whose situation is not known, called al-mustur. And this is the correct view. So let's say that you're going by regional moon sighting and it's just a cloudy, you know, you can't see anything. So the qadi will take the opinion, will take the sighting from one person, one upright person, or a person whose situation is not known, meaning that he's not known to be a facet, an open sinner. He's just a regular guy that nobody knows anything about. Okay. But this really doesn't apply to us because um, that the Hanafi school is, is, um, is preferred to do the global moon sighting. Okay, so this, this is more um, relevant for us. If there is no obstruction in the sky for Ramadan, okay, because we're a global village, then the testimony of al jamr al-Azim is required. A large group is required. Abu Yusuf says 50 people constitute a large gathering. However, the determination of the large gathering is entrusted to the opinion of the Imam. The Imam will determine what a large gathering is, and this is a correct view. So this is where you use the technology. right? You don't use the technology to calculate when the new moon is going to appear when you can't see it. You use the technology uh, to verify moon sightings globally. You have to have Jam al Adin. So let's say that uh, it's the next day is Yom Shek, and there's one man in Jamaica with his telescope I saw the moon, and he tweets it, and it's retweeted over and over again. It's the, it's the responsibility of the ulama to verify this tweet and see if other ulama, they have to contact other people, right? So we have to wait on the ulama, that's the best thing to do. Unless you see it yourself, and then you have to fast, obviously. Okay? And the moon of Eid al-Adha takes the same ruling as Eid al-Fitr. So, in summary, Ramadan with no uh, obstruction. There must be a large gathering to sight the moon. Jam al Adim. Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha. There must be a large gathering confirmed to have sighted the moon. If the sighting of the moon is confirmed in one country, it is necessary upon all the people in all other countries to adhere to this sighting. This is from Ibn Abidi. And they must fast accordingly. This is the most evident view in the Hanafi Madhab. The fatwa issued is in accordance with this view and one in which the majority of the scholars have maintained. However, another view maintains the contrary, such that if the moon is seen in one city but not another, then if the two cities are close, the ruling that the new moon has come applies for both cities. But if the two cities are not close, then the people far from that place where it was seen are not obligated to fast. So, Imam Ghazali, and this is usually the Shafi'i opinion, moon sighting is regional. So Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ghazali is Shafi'i. He says in the Ihya that if the moon is sighted in one town and the distance between it and another town is less than six miles, Farsakhan, six miles or 9.6 kilometers, the people of both towns are required to fast 
But if the distance is greater than six miles, then every town will have its own ruling. Okay, so that's regional moon sighting. Minority opinion in the, or the not preferred opinion in the Hanafi school, that is regional. So for example, if the moon is sighted in San Ramon, Dublin and Danville, they have to fast. The moon is sighted in Dublin, San Ramon has to fast, Alamo has to fast. Sighted in Concord, Walnut Creek has to fast, um, Lafayette has to fast. If the moon is sighted in San Ramon, uh, Fremont does not have to fast because it's more than six miles, right? That's regional moon sighting. But the preferred in the Hanafi school is that it's global. Right? Now let's say that the next day is Yom Shek. Nobody sees the moon during the night. The next day you're walking, during the day you look up, ah, is the moon. And you've already eaten so much food. What happens? So this moon is taken to be the moon of the following night. The moon sighting has to be at night. If the moon was not sighted at night, if you see it in the day, the next day, it doesn't matter. That's not the Ramadan moon. That's not from the night before. That's the, the next night. That which does not nullify the fast. So things that do not, sorry, that which does, yes, that which does not nullify the fast. Okay, eating, drinking, sexual intercourse forgetfully does not break the fast. Forgetfully. Nasiyan. The Prophet in Bukhari, if one of you, uh, if, one, if any one of you uh, forgetfully eats or drinks while fasting, you should complete this fasting, for Allah has fed him and given him to drink. If one has the ability to fast, yet he forgetfully eats and drinks, then he is to be reminded of fasting by onlookers. Failure to remind him is makru. And you should also have a good opinion of people. Maybe someone's traveling or something. Right? But if you know someone that's not traveling, you know where he lives, and you see him, he's at Starbucks, and he doesn't appear to be sick, you know, say something like, Hey, isn't it? Isn't it Ramadan? Are we supposed to be fasting? <laughs> but then he says, if... On the other hand, if this person appears to have no strength or ability to fast, it's better not to remind him. Right? Like a poverty-stricken person. You know, it's just, you know, it's better not to remind him. Even if we don't know that person, if we see in a Muslim drinking a coffee somewhere, it's better to remind him. If you can identify the person as Muslim. But yeah. isn't it offending for that person? to know well, if it's, a, if it's offensive, it depends on how you go about doing it. But, you know, that's the thing is, when I was in high school and I wasn't fasting, somebody offended me, but it worked. <laughs> you know? Sometimes you have to do that. What they say, it's none of your business. That's fine. That's what I said to the brother, too. I said that the Norman Munif, he said, what are you doing? I said, don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing. But then I internalized it. So it worked for, I mean, just, I think it, you're not going to come up to the person and say, ah, you, this is kufr, kafir, fasting. No, it's just a remind, gentle reminder. Say, are you Muslim? Yeah, you know, it's Ramadan, we, should be, we shouldn't be eating. Mm -hmm. And then whatever that person says to you, that's what they're going to say. That's fine. But there should be an encouragement. Sometimes people need that. In Pakistan, when I was living, I seen the hotels, most of them were closed, but some of the hotels were still open. In the daytime, they used to put a curtain so the outsider cannot see people eating inside. Yeah, so even if you're, it's actually sunnah that if you are traveling to do it in secret, to eat. So you, if you're traveling, you're allowed to eat, right? But you don't go to a restaurant in public and start eating. It's makru to do that. You know, buy your food, go back to your hotel. So, because it's haram to put yourself in a position of blame. You know, because you're imitating something that's haram. They don't know you're traveling. So a Muslim should never put himself or herself in a position of censure. You have to be careful about that. Like I used to do that. I used to, when I was, during Ramadan, I used to go to the coffee shop and just put a cup in front of me, an empty cup, to give the people in the restaurant or the coffee shop the appearance that I'm a patron, but I haven't bought anything. But then Muslims come in, you know, for whatever reason. I don't know why they went to a coffee shop during Ramadan. But they would see me there. So it's not like when you see my cup. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's put, I'm putting myself in a position of blame. 
So that's not good to do. It's much rude to do that. <clears throat> yeah. In Muslim countries, like in Iran, like generations ago, the, the Christians would not eat in public because they, they don't want to be called you know, fasiqeen. Even though they're not Muslim, they would find that offensive. Even though they were Christian, they wouldn't eat in public. <clears throat> Okay, so if a person has an orgasm by looking at something or thinking about something sexual, uh, the fast is not broken. Okay, so like, like a man, you know, he uh, takes a nap, his qaylula, after dhuhr, and he wakes up, he had, a, he had an emission in his sleep. Because he was not touched, right, he was not touched by somebody, he did not touch himself, uh, but he had an emission. Um, even if he's looking at something haram and he has an admission without touching himself, he does not have to repeat the fast. Although it's haram to do that, obviously. Since there was no lumps, there was no touching involved. Okay. Um, applying oil to the body does not break the fast. The application of eyeliner does not break the fast. Like kohol, if you put kohol in your eyes, and it says here, even if you even if, you, if the color of the kohol appears in your, uh, it was fasting, Ibn Majah, if one is cupped, you know, like you draw blood, right, it doesn't break the fast. There is a hadith that says the cupper and the one who is subjected to cupping break their fast. But the meaning here is that they lose their reward, not that their fast is literally broken. It's in Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. If a person backbites, it does not break the fast. Someone makes the ghibah. Because there's a hadith that says, the Prophet said, walked by two men, they were making, they were gossiping, they were slandering another man. And he said, their fast is broken. What, what Abu Hanifa took that to mean was that their rewards for fasting have been uh, diminished or lost. That's Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. If one intends to break his fast but does not do so, then he has not broken his fast. So let's say that you're fasting and uh, somebody brings a, it's Ramadan, and there's donuts, and you say, ah, I can't take it. So you go up and you pick up a donut, and you say, ah, and you have a full intention of eating it, and then you hear someone behind you say, Ittaqillah, fear God. Say, ah, you're right. Even though you intended to do it, you didn't do it. Your fast is fine. Even though you made that intention, you were going to do it. And the Prophet said, he actually said, you have a good that's a, that you get a reward for that. Because you didn't do it. <laughs> if smoke enters your throat unintentionally, it does not break the fast. You're walking down the street, someone blows some cigarette smoke into your face and you swallow it, it doesn't break your fast. If dust or the dust of flour or a fly, an insect, or the taste of medicine appears in your throat accidentally while you're fasting, it doesn't nullify the fast. So let's say you're jogging, you know, it's not a good idea probably to do while you're fasting in Ramadan, especially in the summer. But let's say you're jogging and uh, you swallow a mosquito on accident. You swallow it, it goes down, you feel it, you taste it maybe. Your fast is okay because it's an accident. If you pick up an insect and start eating it like that, then there's a difference of opinion. But most of the Arama would say there is some nutrients there. So it would break your fast and you'd have to do kafar also. Um, if, you're, uh, if you just had some cough syrup, it's a suhoor time, it's not fajr. You just had some cough syrup, and you just finished drinking it, and then you hear the adhan, and it's still, the taste is still in your mouth. That's okay. It doesn't break your fast. We talked about this. If you wake up in a state of janaba, a state of greater ritual impurity, and your fast isn't broken, just take a shower and start fasting. If one enters a river or a swimming pool and water enters into the inside opening of the ears, but it doesn't reach the dimaha, it doesn't go into the core of the head, then his fast is okay. You have to be very careful when you're swimming, if you're going to swim. I know that there's a lot of children that swim. My daughters were always swim during Ramadan. Yeah. Try to plug the ears. Okay? Because the ear is allowed to be filled up with water. But if some ear like water goes into the ear, into the core of the head, then the fast is broken. There's no kafara, which you have to make it up. If a 
a person puts a, a twig or a Q-tip into his ear and takes out wax, the, the fast is okay. It doesn't break the fast. If a person has a lot of mucus, you know, and he keeps sniffing it, swallowing it, that's okay to do. In, in that, he, according to him, according to the Shafi'i school, he has to expel it. He has to keep taking it out. A Q-tip also breaks the fast, according to Shafi'i, according to the time. Okay, vomiting. Okay, so let me simplify this here about vomiting. If you intentionally vomit more than a mouthful, your fast is broken, so you have to make it up, but no kafara, no expiation. If you intentionally vomit, intentionally, more than a mouthful, so your mouth fills up with vomit, right? You have to make it up. And if you swallow it again, you still have to, you have to make it up, obviously. There's no kafara, even if you swallow it back. Okay? If you intentionally vomit more than a mouthful, you expel it and then take it back in. You have to do kafara. Anything from the outside going in. If it's unintentional, unintentional, and you vomit a mouthful, and then you swallow, it does not come out of your mouth, and you swallow it again, you're fine. You don't have to do anything. Sometimes, you know, we have these, like, uh, spicy food for suhoor, and then we have these burps, vomit burps. Men have these a lot. So we'll burp, and then something will come up into the throat, and you actually taste it. There's food there, right? And then we swallow it back. Oh, I broke my fast, right? So that was unintentional, right? And it was smaller than a mouthful anyway, so that doesn't break your fast. It's only intentional vomiting that's more than a mouthful. If you intentionally vomit less than a mouthful and even swallow it, you're okay. It's less than a mouthful. In other words, the only thing that breaks your fast is intentional vomiting that's equal to a mouthful or more than a mouthful. Why would anyone do intentionally? Maybe someone feels a little nauseated and they just don't like to be. If they're really nauseated and they're sick, they can actually eat. But if they feel a little bit nauseated, they would ever. You have to make it up. Okay. If someone uh, swallows the traces of food that remain between his teeth from the pre-dawn suhoor meal, it does not break the fast, provided it is less than the size of a chickpea. Okay, let's say that you just had suhoor, and you're sitting there waiting for the adhan. You hear the adhan, and you kind of run your tongue around your teeth, and you find this little piece of food there, and you judge by measuring it with your tongue. You do not take it out and look at it and put it back in. You just kind of Go like that, it's smaller than a chickpea. A chickpea is like this big, right? It's smaller than a chickpea. You can actually swallow it, you're okay. Because it was stuck in your teeth. That's okay. If it's the size of a chickpea and you swallow it, uh, then uh, you have to make qadha. Okay? You have to make up that day. Okay? If it's bigger than a chickpea and you swallow it, so let's say that. You put, a mouth, you put a big spoonful of food in your mouth, it's in your cheek right here, and then you hear the adhan for fajr, and you go, <laughs> now you have to make qadha and kafara. Okay, chewing something like sesame seed that comes from outside the mouth until it melts does not break the fast, provided the taste does not appear in the throat. However, if one swallows a sesame seed that comes... Okay, so let's say that you have, um, you take a sesame seed, which is that big, from the outside, and you put it in your mouth while you're fasting, which is makru to do. You can't chew anything. It's makru to chew anything when you're fasting. But it's not haram. So you're chewing, so you put it in your mouth. And let's say that sesame seed just dissolves in your saliva. It just, dis it just disappears in your saliva. And you don't feel it going down your throat. You don't taste it. Okay? So your fast is okay. But doing that is makru. But let's say that you, you, it didn't melt away. You just chewed it quickly and swallowed it, and you felt it, or you just swallowed it immediately. Now you have to do qadha and kafara. Okay? Understand? Do people do those things, really? I mean, people accidentally, but not intentionally. Yeah, sometimes people, like, people forget they're fasting. So they see something on the table like this, and they put it in their mouth. Yeah. And then they think, oh, I was fasting. But it melted away, so they, you know, so things like that happen. How about now, when, sorry, how about when the 
No, the, the injection doesn't break the fast. Unless it's injected directly into the stomach. Yeah. Blood doesn't break the fast. It's makru to take blood if it makes you weak. But if you can take it, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Now, that which nullifies the fast and requires an expiation. Anything that is performed ta'i'an muta'amidan, willingly and intentionally. So, having, he says here, al-jima'ti ahad al-sabilain al al-fa'il wa al bihi. So, having intercourse in one of the two passageways breaks the fast of both the doer and the receiver. And they have to do expiation and qada, whether or not there was an orgasm. Because the desire is two way. Eating or drinking, whether it is for nourishment or medical benefit, breaks the fast and necessitates expiation and a makeup day. Swallowing rainwater intentionally, intentionally, breaks the fast and necessitates makeup and expiation. Eating raw meat requires expiation and a makeup day. If it's worm infested, then there's no expiation, but you have to make it up. Someone who's going to eat warm infested meat is probably starving or insane. Starving. So they're probably exempt from the fast anyway. Mm. Eating fat or grease requires expiation and a makeup day. He mentioned this again. Eating even something as small as a sesame seed, taking it into the mouth and chewing it or swallowing it whole requires expiation and a makeup day. There's a certain type of uh, soil that pregnant women eat that has some uh, beneficial nutrients in it. Eating that will break your fast and require expiation. But I thought the pregnant woman main is often doesn't have to fast until she um, has a baby. Yeah. So, but this, so she's not pregnant. It's just a, a woman who's not pregnant. She'll eat that soil. Oh. Because it has, because she's used to eating it, for example. Well, it's just soil, right? So she eats it. It's called armani in Arabic. It's a kind of a nutrient-rich soil. So she's not pregnant, but she eats it. Then she has to do it. If she's pregnant, yeah, she doesn't have to fast. But I've seen some pregnant women fasting also. Yeah, you should consult your physician. You, some say if it's the first trimester, it's okay, but I don't think it's a good idea. Just from my experience. There's another type of dirt called tifil, which does not have any medical benefit. Uh, if one does not have the habit of eating that, and they eat it, then it doesn't break the fast. But if one is in the habit of eating non-beneficial soil, then it does break the fast and require expiation. This is an interesting one. Mithu al-qalil fil muhtar. If you take a handful of salt Put it in your mouth like this, then you don't have to make expiation. A handful of salt. But you do have to make up the day. But if it's just a pinch of salt, just a little bit, then you have to make kafara, expiation, and make up the day. Yeah, because taking a handful of salt, again, who's going to do that? Someone who's insane. Someone who's starving, so they don't have to fast anyway. But if it's someone who just, as a joke or something, does it, and there's qadha, you have to make it up, there's no uh, expiation. Swallowing the saliva of one's friend or wife breaks the fast and requires expiation. Be careful if you kiss your wife or husband, keep your mouth closed. Because if you take some of the saliva in, then you have to do expiation, you have to do kafa. But if it's from somebody else, and it happens like by accident, then you only have to do qadha. Like say you're on the bench press, you're lifting weights, and ah, and there's a man who comes by, he sees you're struggling, so he tries to help you. And he says, come on, do it, do it. And some spit comes out of his mouth, and you swallow it. <laughs> you're like, ugh. So if, if that happens, you just have to make up that day. There's no expiation. But if it's your wife or someone like that, and you take some of the saliva, then you have to do expiation. Now this is an interesting one. Okay. So... If a person intentionally eats after backbiting, or after being subjected to cupping, after touching his wife, so on and so forth, um, 
and believes that such acts have terminated his fast, then he is liable for expiation and the makeup day. So, okay, let's say that you're in your house and your uncle, who's not a scholar, walks in and, and he hears you making gliba about somebody else. You're, you're backbiting somebody. And your uncle says to you, oh, you made gliba? Your fast is broken. Go ahead, eat whatever you want. And you say, oh, really? So you start eating. You have to make up that day and do an expiation, a kafara, because you have to seek out scholarship. Right? However, if you call the mufti, you wanted to, your uncle said that, oh, I need to verify this. You call the mufti. And the mufti says, yes, your fast is broken. Right? And you start eating, then you just make up that day. Because the mufti made a mistake. Or you misunderstood him. Do you understand? Or you read the hadith of the Prophet. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, whoever backbites, his fast is, is broken. And you interpret that to mean that my fast has been broken. You don't know the meaning of the hadith, which means the reward has been lost. So you misunderstood the hadith. So you start eating. Then you just make qada on that one day. Is that clear for people? Let's say you're being, you're being cupped. You're taking blood out of your back. Your cousin walks in. Oh, you're being cupped. Your fast is broken. He says, oh, it's really broken? Okay, sir, have your cupcake. You have to make up that day in kafara. But if you call your sheikh, and the sheikh says the same thing, but he's a sheikh, and you take his opinion, then you don't have to make kafara because you follow the right protocol. Or you look in your book of hadith and it says, whoever is cupped, his fast is broken. Oh, I guess it is broken. But you've misunderstood the hadith. Mm. Okay? So the bottom line here is, always seek out no, scholarship. No, yeah. Just don't go with sahih, uh, uh, what is it? Sahih ammi, sahih kapajan. <laughs> How do you say uncle in Urdu? Chacha. Sahih chacha. My uncle said this, my cousin said this. My grandpa said, yeah. We just, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding happening with that. So you, you know, take your deen seriously. Okay, the expiation and that which excuses it. This is he, he starts with a beautiful hadith, this hadith in Bukhari, that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, uh, and said, Ya Rasulullah, I broke my fast during Ramadan, I couldn't help myself and uh, my wife and I had intercourse. So the Prophet says to him, Can you manumit a slave? Can you free a slave? And the man says, No, I don't have any money. So the Prophet says, You have to fast 60 consecutive days. And the man says, I broke my fast on day three of Ramadan. So I, I can't do 60 days. It's impossible for me. So the Prophet he says, You have to feed 60 masakim, four, four people. And he says, I don't have anything. So the Prophet Sallallahu himself goes out and gets a huge basket of dates and he gives it to the man. He says, take this and feed people. And the man says, feed who? And he says, Masaki, wal fuqara, the poor people. And then he said, Wallahi, there's no one in Medina more poor than my own family. And the Prophet Sallallahu smiled and said, take it and feed your family. That was his expiation. <laughs> that was justice being meted out of him by the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> This happens a lot in hadith. The man came to the Prophet and said, after Salat al Asr, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm very concerned. I broke the command of God. Punish me according to God's book. And the Prophet he said, Did you tell anybody? He said, No. He said, Didn't you just pray with us? Didn't you just pray with us? He said, No. Nah. He said, Oh, your, your sin has been forgiven. Go, go, go away. People that will walk around, ha, 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 eat him. Anyway, um, okay. So let's. He says here. Let's say that someone broke their fast intentionally during the day of Ramadan. They broke it intentionally. Let's say a woman broke her fast, and it's like four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So she has to do expiation, but then she she gets her menstrual cycle. She can say Alhamdulillah. Because she doesn't have to do kafara now. She just has to make up that day. <laughs> or a man, you know, he breaks his fast intentionally. You know, that, that donut in the morning was too enticing. So he had the donut. 
And then he's, he gets the flu during that day. Say Alhamdulillah, because you don't have to do the kafara. But you can't intentionally make yourself sick. Like he says here, you can't break your fast and then jump off your roof and break your leg. Say, oh, I can't do kafara with my leg. So that you can't do that. Also, he says here, if you, if you willingly break your fast, you can't say, well, I'm going to go travel now. You start traveling, and then you go out somewhere, and you stay there for a couple of nights. So, oh, was that was the day I traveled. Uh, even if someone forces you to travel, he says. No, you have to do qaba and kafara. There's a brother who asked me one time, a few years ago, he said, I have a lunch interview with non-Muslims. It was during Ramadan. So he said, I'm going to eat because I don't want them to look down upon me. I said, Why would they look down upon you? Why do you think so less of your deen? They're drinking alcohol and, and doing all kinds of crazy things and they're going to look down upon you? So I told him it was a true story. When I, when I, I used to be an accountant. I got this great job in the financial district. And uh, the day they hired me, I was a lowly staff accountant. But they also hired a CFO on the same day. So they took us both out to lunch. You know, Ramadan. So I'm sitting there and like, what would you like? You know, this is in, in your honor. What would you like to order? I said, oh, I'm fasting. And like, oh, really? And then the CFO says, you're fasting? And he was Jewish. And it was Passover. So he had his own meal with him. Like he had the, the, the crackers, the unleavened bread. And then we just started talking and developed this beautiful relationship that lasted the whole five years I was there with the CFO, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I just <laughs> had this really casual conversation with him all the time. And, you know, I got a lot of promotions at that job <laughs> because he really liked me. Yeah, and then he gave me, you know, the, a prayer room and, you know, where to make wudu and things like that. So, yeah, he, never be ashamed. Yeah, never be ashamed. Of, yeah, never be ashamed. Of. I mean, don't, don't, you know, just do things that put yourself in danger. Like this one brother, he said, we were in a, we were in a baseball stadium, and he said, I'm going to go in front of that entire section of bleachers and do my salah. Oh, my God. I said, no, you're not going to do that. I don't care what people think about it. No. Relax. Take a deep breath. Relax. Because that, that's putting your life in danger. You missed the point. And people, you know, people are ignorant. I mean, people literally out there think that we're like the enemy. Well, and it seems sometimes people are basically showing off, or they think, oh, that's Dawah, but it's not yeah. that when other people are looking. Yeah, they have to really check their attention for something like that. Yeah, so yeah, making Dawah and things like that. But it's, it's, a, it's a precarious situation. If you don't have a choice, you have to pray, try, you know, try to conceal yourself, but don't, like, pull over on the side of the highway and start praying for cars are going by. Terrorists! <laughs> I've seen that happen before. I said, well, just go over here and run to the door. Are you ashamed to pray? Just pray right next to the road. People driving by shouting at us. Yeah. How about in the airplane? They say you have to stand up and pray. But sometimes I've seen people standing up in a domestic flight. Usually yeah. and they're standing in the middle. They go tell the air hostess and then they stand and pray. So is that nowadays, uh, like, you know, terrorists, you know, going on, so it's yeah, my advice is not to do that. Um, you know, you can when you're traveling, you can take a ruksa from the shafi'is and, and combine prayers. There's even an opinion that you don't have to pray on an airplane. And if you want to do that, just make sure that you tell like the stewardess or the or the steward. I, I don't think those are politically correct terms anymore. Flight the flight attendant. Flight tell the flight attendant <laughs> that you're going to pray, uh, and you can actually. There is a little room that people don't know about, but there is a room there that you can actually go into. It's by the bathroom, but you can actually go there. And you can actually even pray in the bathroom if there's no najasa on the floor. It's totally permissible to do that. Um, but my advice is not to... You can even pray in your, in your seat. Pray in your seat. Yeah, you can pray in your seat. It's not, it's not desirable. You'd have to do it later again. So pray in your seat. Try to orient yourself towards the tip of Look out the window. Have your compass. Have your compass. Do your prayer there, and then and then do it again later yeah. when you're when you're in. Oh, well, you have to do it later. Yeah, because the thought, thought of the prayer uh -huh. in the seat is sort of a temporary sort of uh, um, solution. Buy you some time. Hmm. And by the way, can we do it before? Once I'm traveling, instead of making it up later, do it before. 
Yeah, I mean, you can, you can bring Asura forward to Dohar time and pray Asura. And that's a Shafi'i Rosa. And I, I, take, I take that opinion when I travel. It just makes life so much easier. How about Maghrib? Like, uh, you can delay Maghrib to Isha time. Isha. But you can only do that for three days. Only one. Yeah. So it's good to do while you're traveling, going airport to airport, yeah. things like that. Yeah. So basically, you pray three times a day. You pray at Fajr, obviously. Bring Asr to Dhuhr, delay Maghrib to Isha. You can do Isha at you know, yeah. 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, until you have a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The expiation. How do you do Kafara? What is Kafara? This is important here. Bayan al-Kafara. Al-Kafara tahrilu laqaba wa lo kanat ghayru mu'mana. Okay, so the expiation is the manumission of a slave, male or female, who is physically and mentally sound, even if they're non-Muslim. If one is unable to do that, it's sort of obsolete nowadays. Yeah. I mean, te technically prisoners are slaves, right? I mean, they're not getting paid. Maybe you can bail somebody out of prison. Allahu a'lam. You'd have to actually talk to a, a mufti about that. But, you know, it's, it's somewhat obsolete. Uh, then he has to fast two consecutive months. And these two months must not coincide with the Eid or the days of Tashriq. So check it out. So you have... Uh, so you have Ramadan which is month nine, and no, Ramadan is month eight. Nine. Nine, yes. Month nine, seven, eleven, twelve. Okay, so what, what is the date of Shawwal? What is the date of Shawwal? Ten. Ten, one, right? The yes. first day, yeah. the first day of Shawwal, Eid al-Fitr. Yeah. And then the next Eid is what? Twelve, ten, right? So if you're going to make kafara, you have to fast 60 consecutive days. If you get to day 57 and you don't fast, you have to start over. You have to be careful because if you start, you know, so here's, if you start on 10-2, you're going to be done on 12-2. You can't run into Eid. So if you start in the middle of Dhul Qa'da, and you're, this happened before, this brother had fasted like 38 days. And then the next week was Eid. So he had to start over. He didn't realize what he had done. So if you're going to make kafara immediately after Ramadan, do it, start, a, start right after Eid. Right? Start right after Eid. And you can have a double intention. You can say, I'm, this is my makeup fast for Ramadan, and it's also, I'm, I'm intending the reward of the six days of Shawwal. Or you have to wait until the Muharram. Then you have a lot of time there mm -hmm. to do the kafara. If you don't want to fast 60 days, you can feed 60 poor people, 60 masakim. Okay, you have to feed them two meals, um, and it has to be satisfying meals to what they're accustomed to. You have to they have to be mushabirin. Uh, Mushabi'in means they have to be satiated. Food that they're accustomed to. So you don't go somewhere to give someone a samosa who's never had a samosa. Here's some chicken tikka masala. It's going to be difficult to, you know? Yeah. But here's the thing. You have to feed, you have to make sure that you feed the same 60 people the second meal. So let's say you go to a homeless shelter, right? And you there's 80 people there. And you give them all lunch. Right? You have to make sure, maybe take down names, right? Yeah, because when you come back for Isha, there may be 80 people there, but 20 of those original guys are gone. So now you still have 20 to give two meals. You can't just give one. Each person has to get two meals from you. Okay? Or what you can do is feed one poor person two meals a day for 60 days. Or, it says here, you can give 60 people the equivalent in cash. The equivalent in cash. But you have to use judgment here. You have your hikmah, because many people, they use cash for alcohol and drugs and things like that. That's, you know. 
So it's probably better to give food, but use your use your judgment. You can Two give it for one day. Huh? One yeah, day. One day. One day yeah. Two meals so to sixty people. Yeah. Same people. Is that the same? Yes. Same people. And you can give this either to the fuqara or the masakin. What is the difference? What is a faqir? A faqir is someone who is, as they say, broke as a joke. No money in his bank account, no job, nothing. He has nothing. That's a faqir. Okay? The miskeen is someone who has some means but needs some, a little bit of help. Nothing. So you can give it to either, either one of you. How about orphanage? Like orphanage with children every day. Let me, let me check on that. Because Sometimes the orphanage would normally to have... To feed the orphanage in like third world, like Pakistan or some other, feed the orphanage, so... so. Let me uh, check on that. I can, uh, well, I'll send the email, the answer, inshallah, online. And, and the reason for doing the shaykh would be because an orphanage normally there's children, and so there's no condition on they have to be adults and things like that. Is that yeah, let me, let me check on that. I don't know. Okay. Now, one expiation suffices for many days of eating. So let's say that, uh, and this happens, you know, Muslim, you know, you have born again Muslims. So they started practicing, let's say there's a, a young man, he started actually practicing when he was 20 years old. And you're supposed to start when you're 15, about, or about 15. So five years of fasting he's missed. Does that mean that he has to do kafara 150 times? Because 30 times 5 is 150. No. Do kafara one time, 